Welcome, welcome to the second edition of the virtual alumni talks. My name is Peter Kovac from CQ Savvy, and it is our pleasure to host this. And uh, today we have Juan Martin Branchi, who is a human capital consultant. He's been helping teams and people find their purpose and increase their impact for over 10 years. So, Martin, please go ahead and share all this great information and training that you have with us. Well, thank you, Peter, so much for this introduction and for the invitation to participate in this series of alumni talks. I'm very happy to be able to talk about this thing, which is something that lots of people are asking these days. How do I get my team to be focused behind a goal? How do I motivate them? How do I turn them into more productive? Uh, this, all of these questions lead to just one answer, which is purpose. Uh, it's the, the, the focus of where you want to go and how you're going to get there. So I'm happy to be sharing this with, with the community of alumni and others who are registered for this talk. So um, I, I think it's going to be a valuable exchange. And uh, I can see some people saying hi now. Vernia, for example, from Bolivia. Hi, Vernia. Nice to see you there. All right, so I'll just uh, start with the presentation and um, uh, be sure to ask some questions in the, in the general chat so that I can expand on certain concepts I might be going through um, uh, slightly fast so that I can uh, cover all the material I have for this day. So uh, let me just start the presentation. There. Okay. So this is, uh, like I said, it's about purpose and it's about leadership, but it's about a specific uh, set of practices that differentiate those who actually uh, work with the idea of purpose in their minds. And uh, I, I wanted to, to, to have this image, that, like you, to see the rock balancing thing, that something that, that for a lot of us seems impossible and like something that can't really be achieved and you wonder if it's a if it's a hoax, if it's true. So I want to I want to keep that idea of something that looks impossible, but is actually done in less than ten minutes by those who actually know how to do it. Is it? Is, can any can everybody hear? Somebody is saying that there's a problem with the sound. Can anybody hear? I can hear. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to move on, and if the problem persists, we can try and figure out. I can hear Mario as well. All right. So I wanted to talk about three things today. First part is a leader's purpose. The second part is the organization, and the third part is a team. So I'm going to be dividing this talk in three parts. And uh, please, please uh, feel free to just ask questions or, or comments so that I can include that in my conversation. Now, when it comes to the to the leader part, the leadership part, most of us probably know a lot about leadership in terms of the work aspects, right? The know-how, how to delegate, how to have effective meetings or strategies or planning, um, clear communication, team design, all of these things, these things are skills that you can actually acquire working with others and uh, by experience, either in NGOs, companies, projects of your own. So these are the aspects that are easier, let's say, and I, and I group them in the know-how part. And then I, I use this term quite loosely, which is a feel-how, that has to do with the energy. Energy is something that's subjective, it's emotional, sometimes it's spiritual. It has to do with who you are and how, does it, how another person makes you feel, how the leader makes you feel. So this is about empowering, developing, it's about setting up a context where people can develop, it's about connecting people to a purpose, managing the energy levels, all of these things that you're seeing right there, they have to do with someone else. I mean, that other person needs to say, yes, this is happening. I can't say I've empowered someone without that person validating that the empowerment actually happened. So the, these are the things that depend on the recipients and their acceptance or validation of, of that actually having happened to them. Um, therefore, that person's uh, own um, energy is, is the, the, um, the test that it's actually happened. You can say, well, I, I appreciate individual input, but if, each of your members say that they don't feel hurt and that they don't feel like their input is valuable. Well, then it, it doesn't really matter what you say, it matters what they say, because this is about making them feel something, making them feel empowered, making them feel um, connected to a purpose. So I wanted to differentiate these things because when it comes to being a good boss or being a good leader, it has to do with the skills. And when it comes to being a purposeful leader, it has to do with 
dominating the, the dimension of the energy of someone else. In the end, we live in a world where it's all about energy. I mean, we, you can buy my time, you can buy my body, be it a, be it a place, you can buy uh, a profile on LinkedIn, you can buy all of that and you can put that person in a position, but if that person doesn't fill up that role with their own personal energy, then you're not gonna get much. So this is all about getting the energy right. Um, these kinds of things, you know, I, I, lots of people believe in chakras, lots of people believe in energy, believe in uh, harmonizing that, believe in, in a lot of these things. And a lot of people, and a lot of other people don't believe. But the fact that you don't believe doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. I mean, you can believe or not that someone needs to feel connected to a purpose and that is a subjective feeling and that you can't really force that upon anybody. But the fact that you don't believe in that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist and that other person's uh, own, own personal uh, belief system. So it's interesting to consider this beyond your own beliefs, beyond your, well, it doesn't matter. You know, as long as you give them a good goal and a good salary, people are going to get, we're going to, you know, they're going to invest their entire energy into that. Well, it, sometimes pr there is enough proof to say that sometimes it doesn't work. So when it comes to, uh, what do I need from my team in terms of a leader? I know that there's a dimension of the job well done, which is I need the person to be in that role and do that thing and have it done. And then, of course, delegation, effective meetings, all of that has to do with the job well done. But then I need extra energy. I need ideas. I need innovation. I need connection with a purpose. I need contribution. I need uh, fidelity. I need commitment. All of those things are given by the person to the cause, to the team, to the purpose, voluntarily you can't force that you can't make that happen you just have to know how to get them to give you that amount of energy uh, again we're talking about energy all the time and purpose is about is, is the ultimate uh, source of energy and this is what the, this, this talk is going to be about um, so how do I become the leader that I need to be and there are three things that I, that I mentioned here strategic vision commitment to the values but most of all personal journey. And I mentioned discipline here because in, in the end, it comes with the key practices that these type of leaders uh, have, which is, you know, the ability to really act and behave in a way that is according to some standards or some uh, core beliefs or some practices that this person, that the leader thinks that, that they can't just be um, natural or let's say, well, I behave according to what I feel and I I sense things. Well, the truth is that when you become a purposeful leader, you really have your own discipline and you focus on what, uh, how to shape your behavior according to what you believe is right, regardless of, of your feelings in terms of having a, an, an urge or an opinion or something that causes uh, you to feel in a certain way. So I wanted to talk a lot about uh, inner journey because it is something that is understated, it's something that doesn't really get a lot of attention in terms of what is an actual inner journey. Beyond the fact that it could be a physical journey, it actually means that you take the time to explore uh, your, yourself beyond the typical um, conversational questions such as, what are you doing and what do you do, what's your plan and what are you going to do next year and will you follow that dream or will you pursue that, that, that idea? But the thing about inner journey is that it actually has to do with these key questions of, you know, how am I? Um, who do I want to be? How do I want to live? You know, what fulfills me as a person? All of these questions are really important to understand. They need a constant revision. You don't feel the same when you're 20, when you're 30, when you're 40. Uh, I'm 41 and I've actually changed my questions, my, 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 the answers to my questions uh, in, in the past 20 years since I've known these concepts. Uh, so it, it really needs a constant revision and say, well, do I still want this? Does, does this still make me happy? Do I still feel fulfilled when I do this? Or, or has this changed for me? Uh, the, 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 the good thing about purpose is that it really um, makes you wonder as you grow older and as you become different versions of yourself, you really, if you really stick with your initial idea of purpose. Uh, who you were when you defined that, who you are today, there may be a gap, it may be the same person, it may be a different version of yourself. So these questions are really important to keep them there and feel uh, constantly challenged to, to reply to. Now, these are the, the things, you know, what's my own personal vision? What type of projects and organizations are ideal for my vision? 
what do I need to develop in order to activate my vision? This has to do with the fact that sometimes what you want is already being done by someone else, is already um, happening, it's or there's, there's, there's other places. Yes, I will send the PPT, don't worry. Um, so these are the things that really have to do with uh, defining something that, it, that, you, that you feel is, you, is, is, is in your path, but also understanding that you might need to develop skills, that you need to develop uh, a broader uh, range of knowledge that you need to train that you need to acquire certain skills so it doesn't have to do with this very uh, childish idea that you set your mind to something and then you go 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 and you get it this is not really about that 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 simplify uh, simplified version of, 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 find, of defining something for you it's about saying okay I want to become this person and and, and in 70 it will take me seven years to get there because I need to get this for this before that before and then I will get there in seven years and then that's my own personal vision so it's a bit more complex than that. That's why the inner journey has to be very precise and very focused on, on really um, giving proper answers, deep answers to those questions. I personally went on the Camino de Santiago, for instance, in Spain, which is a walk that can take three, four weeks, two weeks. And it's really, it's really about going into uh, your own personal journey. So I really recommend this kind of uh, walks or this kind of retreats or taking three days out, or Vision Quest, for instance. In I know there are some countries have that um, uh, that, that experience available for people to take it. Uh, so these are the kind of things that you really need to stop and think about. These are the books that I recommend when you really want to go deep. Um, they're really really good. They're they're different in essence. Like Synchronicity is about is, is a novel. The Leading Consciously is a series of text. Then The Soul of Leadership is a practical guide to fill in the blanks and, and write about it. And Meta Management is a text about organizations, teams, dynamics, but it, they all circle around the same idea. You, know, you need to have a very clear um, idea of who you are and how you're going to lead a, a life that's going to be fulfilling for you and for, for others. I also, before we move forward, I also recommend a very good friend of mine, Dieter Langenecker, who is part of the alumni community, who's an expert in, in purpose searching and definition and uh, he's a great coach for those who want to have uh, a partner in defining these things um all right so the the, the slides about the, the key practices and i want to have this very this is a very important thing um usually underestimated and usually just simply said and and not very not, not many times practiced uh, in full. So mental discipline has to do with control, resilience, with having the ability or the tools to detox your mind when you've been through a lot of, uh, of challenges and how to keep your mind sane and clean and, uh, and in optimal conditions to, to pursue different things. Like sometimes people go from project to project, they don't detox, they don't process what they've been through, they don't understand what key learnings. In terms of this is a mental uh, dimension, so it is a very mental um, stage or, 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 you know, the things you can analyze are very mental. That means that you can have a logical process and understand, okay, I failed here, but the project failed or something happened or I learned or I gained or I, I, I got this or, and why did that happen? You know, why, why is it exactly that I, that I made this, um, that, I, that I achieved this? What happened? Um, was it because of this? Was it because of that? It's very important to, to, to store knowledge about yourself in the proper way and not assume that because something something went right then you're perfect or something went wrong and then you're 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 a failure so the lo lots of things about uh, mental discipline has to do with control control means that the mind is controlled by you and you're not controlled by your mind which is a whole a whole topic on itself and i and I, i'm sure the readings i just recommended can help you understand these kind of differences you know the mind and you different things and you've been able to have control over your mind. Uh, and of course, resilience, and it's very important as well because you have to be able to stand up before you do all this processing of information and all this, you know, thinking about what went wrong, what went right. It's important that you have the resilience to really step away and say, okay, I'll move forward with this information now. The physical discipline is a very important thing and it's a key practice that I was mentioning before. Key practices. How do I gain resistance? How do I, you know, regenerate myself? How do I gain the energy that I need and to have the enthusiasm I, I need for these projects to be the leader? 
uh, a lot, I see a lot of leaders neglect this area of their lives, you know, the, the, the physical discipline. They work a lot longer than their bodies agree to work. They push the limits. They, they, they force, uh, you know, uh, eating disorders. All of these things happen because they, they underestimate the importance of the physical aspect to what they're doing. So it's important to keep in mind that purposeful leadership is about a balance between these different things, you know the mental aspect, the physical aspect. So then of course the spiritual aspect because you are faced with lots of challenges every day and here comes you know, peace, calm, wisdom, humility. It's the ability to really come back to your core, to your essence and, 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 and find a way to, to, um, to not be conditioned by everything that's happening to you, let's say. Well, because a lot of these people you know, fail to live up to my expectations and I won't trust anybody anymore. And, you know, these kind of things, I've seen them happening a lot of times with companies, with teams that uh, they try at, they try something out and then it doesn't work. Then they learn that uh, they shouldn't do them anymore when, in fact, it was poorly applied or it was in the wrong context. And th it's important to review the past permanently. And, of course, the productive discipline that has to do with planning ahead, satisfaction, realization, what makes you happy in terms of the tasks. So these four areas are very important and a lot of disciplines and practices come from the uh, knowledge or the idea that uh, you can't have one without the other. You can't be a productive person if you don't have good healthy mental habits, if you don't have a good physical discipline, if you don't have any core to come back to, if you're empty inside, you know, these big, and not empty because you are empty, but because you don't have that um, that it's not easy for you to come and go from your own core because uh, you haven't spent the time thinking about, you know, who you are and what you want to do. And, and, and all of these things are very important. How do you apply that to a team? Perfect. I'll, I'll go to that in, in a second. But uh, in general, it's important for you to be first the one who has this. And I want to move forward to this image, which is the reason why this guy can balance these rocks and do them, you can search on YouTube for these videos, rock balancing. Um, they achieve this in seven, eight, six minutes sometimes. And the reason why this guy can do this is that he himself is a balanced individual. His energy, his core, everything about him is in balance. And that's why he can put these rocks to balance in, in less than 10 minutes. It's not only a skill that has to do with the rocks, it's also uh, a discipline that has to do with himself, how he sits, how his back is, how his body is flowing. And it's interesting to know that if you want to shape a team, like you were saying, Patricia, just to shape a team or, or get them aligned or work with them, you first need to be in balance yourself and extend these practices to all of them, meaning that they also need to want to be this, this uh, type of leader or type of collaborator. It can't just be an order from you. It can't just be something that you push upon them. So in terms of the leader's purpose, it has to do with inner journey. It has to do with finding the right, um, the right practices for you and making sure that you're in the right, in, in the good, healthy uh, core position in order to go outside to the world and, and, and impact them with your own philosophy. So when it comes to the, to the second part, um, the project's purpose, I wanted to focus on these things that um, have to do with philosophy and strategy. If you think about the individual and the organization, first of all, conscious organizations, organizations that learn from their past, that, that spend time thinking about themselves, you know, that hold retreats, that have planning meetings, that have vision uh, definition meetings. All of these organizations, they are pretty much like individuals. I mean, the first definition is what is important to me, what is my purpose? What gives meaning to my existence? How is the world I want to live in? All of these questions, both organization and the individual uh, carry out as, as something that is in the back of their minds, you know, regardless of how many practices or, or uh, the, the size of your operations, you still wonder, you know, why, why do we do what we do? And when it comes to strategy, it says, okay, where do I go to fulfill my, my, my purpose, my philosophy? Uh, where can I realize myself? Who lives by the values I call my own? You know, do I want to work in the pharmaceutical industry? Yes, no, because of some philosophical things. Do I want to work in the fast food um, industry? Well, no, because I don't believe in this. Or yes, I believe in something there. 
Do I want to work with um, wildlife conservation? Yes, because I feel attached. I feel connected to that idea. So you're finding your strategy, uh, both organizations and individuals do, according to your philosophy and where you want to go. So continuing with this idea, you say, okay, there's philosophy, there's strategy, but then there's also tactics. And you say, is this field of work where I can contribute to the most of my personal purpose? I mean, you start wondering, am I adding value to my, pers my personal purpose by being in this industry? Do I want to change? Do I want to work here? Uh, is this connected to who I am? These questions are both happening for individuals and for organizations. And of course, what I'm saying is that you should choose to work in organizations or teams or projects where there is some kind of uh, learning involved, where some kind of uh, awareness of the organization itself, uh, when spend time talking about their impact and what they're doing and, and what the meaning of what they do is. And finally, here is this practice. So you have philosophy, you have strategy, you have tactics, and you have the practice, which in all of these cases are continuously evolving. You know, organizations define their purpose, used to define their vision for seven, ten years. Now it's a lot shorter than that. And they define a set of core, core beliefs, a set of principles, and of course, the rest of the lineup can change. In this case, the practice is you say, okay, is this how we were supposed to be doing this? Are we living up to the standards that makes us feel proud and connected to our purpose? These are the questions that have to do with the practice that you solve as a team, as an organization, when you, when you are aligned in all the other uh, areas. But of course, who aligns this? Well, it's the leader. That's why we started with the leader, the part one, is the leader who is in charge of aligning all of these things and, uh, and connecting the dots, let's say. So I need to make sure that uh, at a philosophical level, both individual and organization are connected and also at a strategy level. So you believe in this, you think that this is the place for you, then you agree that this is the area you wanna be working in. And then, of course, the practices, because I might be aligned with all of these other areas, but I don't believe in the practices, right? I mean, I believe the organization is great and everything, but I don't believe in the practices that they have. So I can't be giving you my best energy if I don't believe in this. So we might be aligned with philosophy, strategy, tactics, but definitely not in practice. Um, for instance, one of the great companies that we have here in Buenos Aires that does um, healthy food. It's a great company, lots of people work there, they're very happy, everybody's satisfied, but I, um, in terms of the practice, they use a lot of plastic to wrap up everything they give you. So if you order a salad, they give you five different bags for the cutlery, for the salad, for everything. So you end up wasting a lot of plastic for every single piece of salad you eat. And I wouldn't be able to work there because I don't agree with the practice. I agree with the philosophy of buying organic food, I agree with the strategy, I agree with everything, but I don't agree with the practice. I would never be a, a, an energetic employee or collaborator of this company or even consultant because I don't believe with the practice. So this has to be aligned at all four levels in both individual and organizations. Okay, before I move on to part three, which is the last part, and then I, of course, I'm open to any questions and, and, and comments. Is there anything you'd like to ask specifically about the part two? I just went through it quite uh, quick just to make room for everybody to participate. Is there anything you'd like to ask about the part two? Okay, I'll move on to the part three. I have a question back to our journey. How common is it that the practice is not aligned? Okay, so let's go with the, uh, our journey uh, first and then I'll go with the how common. How can I evaluate my practices in the team? Okay, well, in terms of, let's go back to the first uh, journey. Um, there, it is, it does take a big investment on your, on your behalf to really, on your part, sorry, to really get these questions. It might be a, an afternoon with a nice cup of tea or it might be a longer time. But the truth is that that inner journey part, um, I usually advise it to have a guide or to have a, either a person guide or, or, or a written guide so that you can start ask, uh, answering questions. Um, it's important to get all the, all the connections of your belief system really uh, tied up and really uh, matching so that there's no loose end. But to say, oh, I didn't really think about this. I want this, but I, want, I also want that, and that's contradictory. Okay, I haven't thought that through. So it is important to really uh, have a guide to make sure that you're asking you're 
answering the right questions in terms of, of the inner journey. Uh, in terms of the practice is not aligned, it's super common, Maria. It's super, super common because um, you get you go into a hype of agreeing in the philosophy and it's overlooked. Sometimes it's overlooked. The, the practice gets overlooked because you're so uh, in agreement of the philosophy. So you end up thinking, well, but if, if this practice is coming from this organization, I'm sure it's okay because they believe in all of this. Uh, and and there's, there's, there's a lot of proof that... Um, Sometimes it's easier to be, to say you believe in something that you, that to actually practice what you preach. So, for instance, I went to this um, conference on sustainability, and I was shocked to see that they had plastic glasses or plastic cups for for the drinks uh, in the break. So, you know, these things happen all the time. Sometimes it's a, something that you don't really think about, and uh, when you bring to your attention and say, oh, yeah, we forgot, I mean, we didn't think about it, but you're right. And sometimes it's, you know, pure hypocrisy. It's just, well, you know, when it comes to these little things, we don't really um, walk the walk, let's say. So it is common. And in terms of how can I evaluate my practices in the team? Well, first of all, are you going to see it here, uh, Vernia? Uh, we're going to talk about this right now. But first, I go to Patricia and she says, regarding the journey, and if I have to project myself, how do you do that with the actual changing world? Great. I mean, isn't it a bit old fashioned nowadays? I thought we need much more open minded with our vision. Exactly. That is exactly what I said in the, in the slide on the, on the inner journey part. I said, who I am today is not who I was when I was 20, not who I was when I was 30. Um, I need to constantly be open to revisiting these things. And differentiate what's core, what's my spirit, let's say, what will never change in terms of my nature, what makes me, me, different to what I believe, let's say. So right now, I believe that I can contribute to teams and people and their development because that makes me happy. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm holding this webinar because it makes me happy to imagine that I can contribute to somebody's um, improvement and their team and and all that. But maybe in five years, it, it doesn't make me happy anymore. And it doesn't fulfill me. And it's something from my past. But what won't change in me is my nature. So it is my nature to help others. It is my nature to give what I have. It's my nature to share what, I, what I've learned. And it's, it's my nature. It's, it's always been the same from when I was a little kid to who I am today, 41. It's the same. So my nature is the same. My inner journey, my, my, my purpose definition might, might change or might evolve. And that's why I mentioned in this, in this uh, other slide, it says continuously evolving. If you see it here, individual and organization, it says continuously evolving, meaning that maybe for the next two, three years, you define something that fulfills you. And maybe three years from now, when you sit down again and say, well, it's still relevant for me today, or no, it's, it's a bit, um, it's, it's gone. It's, it's not, lo not longer in me to do these things. But it's important, like I said, and, and, and let me just finish the idea, it's important to differentiate the nature, your own personal nature, to your uh, belief system when it comes to purpose and activities, because purpose defines what you do, um, and nature defines who you are. So you can have a doctor who leaves medicine, which for 20 years was his purpose and made him happy and made him realize, and then he, he becomes a singer at 41, uh, and he wins an an Oscar for a song he designed for a movie, and this is the case of the singer, the Uruguayan singer Jorge Drexler, who got an Oscar for the Motorcycle Diaries. And he was a doctor up until he was 40, or late 30s. Uh, and it's not because it wasn't his purpose and he found his true purpose, it's because it, he evolved and it changed and it became a different thing. He became a musician uh, or a professional musician after having been a doctor. So it is, it is a, a very uh, evolving thing, and we should be respectful of that. And that's why we should check with someone who agreed to work with us seven years ago if this cause he's working in or she's working in is still relevant to who they are today, because it definitely changes. So I agree with you that, that it, is a, it is an old-fashioned thing to define the purpose in terms of a fixed idea opposite to your nature, which is a fixed idea. It's different. It's, it's very... It's a very challenging idea to say that your nature may change from a generous one to a selfish one, from a given one to a taken one, from an open one to a closed one. You might be blocking your nature. Maybe somebody 
a lot of people betrayed you and you feel like you're too generous and maybe you decide to become a, a selfish person and you don't but you're actually blocking your nature you're not changing your nature because the moment you feel like you can be generous you will be generous so it is something that is in you it's your nature um, okay moving on um, also we cannot change the nature of our teams we can never change anybody's nature anybody that's why you know I work in selection processes I've been working with that for for a number of years now over 15 years and it's impossible to change someone's nature it's very possible to uh, to, to make them see how uh, something that they might not be seeing is actually connected to their nature so maybe someone is, is very uh, generous and very giving and they don't see how in your project they can be that so they don't connect it and they become apathetic and they don't really you know they don't want to work with you but you might have a way to show them that they can fulfill their nature and can fulfill their purpose by working with you because there is a connection and sometimes that happens I've seen it in, in other organizations okay great so moving forward with the team members and their own personal purpose um, here I mentioned the alignment triangle because it is something that in the end, it has to do with meaning, right? Which is the team's purpose aligned to the organizational purpose, then the team members and their own individual purposes, and of course, your own personal purpose as a leader. All of these things, they have to be aligned around the idea of meaning. It has to mean something to you to achieve the team purpose. It has to mean something to the team members for themselves, and it has to mean something uh, for the organization. The organization needs to benefit from your team's effort, your team's purpose. And uh, it's great to understand and, and spend the time to actually align these things. As we said, we started off from aligning ourselves to our core, developing disciplines and becoming more nature-centered, let's say, and not so much um, operation-centered. So this is the first, the first part. The second part is saying, okay, who do I, where do I want to go? And, which organization, context, project, um, development will be the perfect setting for me to blossom in my purpose. Okay, that's part two. And then part three to say, who am I going to work with? And this is important to say that you can't, like Patricia was just saying, you can't change a person's nature or a person's perception of, of who they are, even if you can't go deep inside and find out who they really are, if they're blocking who they actually are, or they're just that person you know from nature but uh, so the selection of who you work with is very important and uh, a lot of people underestimate this and say okay well, I'll bring them and I'll, I'll shape them my you know to my own taste and that's not really uh, sustainable in the long term it can happen out of fear at the beginning but it won't stay that way for a long time so it is important to spend the necessary time to find the right talents to find the right passion to understand their idea of purpose to understand um, how aware this person is of who they are in terms of having gone through a, their own personal inner journey and if they haven't then you still need to see what happens after they do it's not like okay come and I'll, I'll, I'll make you go through something and see what happens next but in the meantime you work for me so when it comes to purposeful leadership purposeful organizations teams that are connected around the meaning not around a salary not around uh, prestige not around you know uh, this organization is going to make me sound good in my CV and all of that when it's really about meaning you really take the time to incorporate something into it someone into your team and to understand who they are deep inside so here I talk about the team building retreat which is an in inevitable uh, unavoidable stage moment uh, when you really take the time to understand the individual's journey to understand um, the fears and challenges and contradictions that all of us have. It's not something that you become a saint and you know everything and you're ever wise and you're, you, you're just full of knowledge and, and, and wisdom. No, you are a human being who's going through contradictions and challenges and fears and, and sometimes you know what to do and sometimes you don't. Sometimes you're afraid of making a mistake and sometimes you're certain that you're not going to make one. So it is about understanding this individual's journey the fears, the challenges, the contradiction, finding a common ground and saying, okay, this is where we connect as people. Because you're not leading employees, you're not leading collaborators, you're not leading um, uh, team members, you're leading, you're leading people. I mean, the, the, the leadership belief that you are one when you're at work and you are 
a different person or it's a different dimension. The truth is that in the end, it's us as people who have to validate, legitimate someone as a leader. And it's their behavior and their uh, coherence what makes us say, yes, this is the kind of person I want to work with. Um, so when you find the common ground with the people, as, as we are this team of people who actually have this set of beliefs, who have gone through these struggles, who are um, mobilized by the same dream, or our dreams are compatible, then you find a team's, the team's new creed, which is this is what we believe now, and we have built something that is our own, and this is the whole joy of becoming one is to say, before today, they were just individuals, and now there's a team, but not because we've done some you know, team building practices of games and letting yourself drop so that somebody can hold you. Not, not that kind of physical becoming one. It's, it's more of a spiritual becoming one, saying these are the people that I can walk with in order to achieve uh, my purpose. And that, um, that magic, when it really happens, it's a bond that's very, very hard to break. I mean, it can it can sustain storms and it can sustain uh, bad moments and failures and setbacks and things you don't expect from other people. But but you have that one place which you can go and is a team spirit. Uh, so I've I've met many teams that had a great a great run of success. Uh, but they were empty, they were void, they didn't know why they were not happy, they didn't know why they were not enjoying their success. Uh, they didn't really know any of that. And it was because they hadn't become one. They were just individuals working together. Uh, and when I meet teams that are actually one, that have become one, you can definitely tell that this is the kind of team that any organization would want in their um, staff because it really, they can tackle any problem and they can just, They've, they've, they've um, learned and acquired the skill to overcome things and achieve more and get further. So this is the, the recommendation I have for, uh, for the team building retreats, to really spend time listening, spend time investing in someone else and their story and their journey. And I recommend the book, um, a hero, with, a hero with a Thousand Faces from Joseph Campbell because it really describes the different stages uh, of, of when you go into your, into your journey, into your own personal journey, the different stages that, that, def, that define uh, how you're going to get through and what you're going to learn from having walked that walk. So these are the three things that I wanted to talk to you about today. It has to do with the leader and, the, and it's finding the balance. It has to do with the organization and connected indiv connecting individual uh, philosophy, strategy to um, to uh, the organization, and then the team. The book I just mentioned is called A Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell, and you're going to find short versions of it that simplify the idea that you go through 12 different stages as you leave the comfort zone of your family, your city, your environment, and you take a risk, and that risk pays off, and then you've learned something, you've acquired something, you've become a different version of yourself. And it's amazing to find so many similar similarities between different cultures and how they build their myths around the same stages of achievement. So I really recommend you, this book is, is very much referred in, in different books and other places. If you read the other books I recommended, you will find it mentioned many, many times. It's, it's, a, it's a basis for a lot of stuff. So I wanted to make this short, and I've kind of accomplished my 40-minute goal of, of presenting these ideas so we can have a bit of uh, a conversational time, uh, and, and, and we can go through different questions or, or, or possible solutions or cases that you want to present and ideas I might be able to, uh, to share with you. Okay. Anybody? Any questions? We're about the scenario where a person is blocked or doesn't want to be helped. The change might start with must start with oneself, right? As a leader, what is my place in this situation? Great. Well, this is this is a great question because it is it is to do with the idea that you can, from the outside, uh, influence or let's say um, push someone to go into a certain 
moment of decision of what to do. Do you want to change? Do you want to stay the same? So in my, in my perspective, um, all you can do is just present the options, but um, present the options, but don't invest and in, in, don't, don't put the energy to actually move someone else. Uh, the adult thing to do here is to say, look, you either do this, you either change or you either invest in changing or you either search within yourself what it is that, uh, that is happening to you right now or this is the other way we can go. Uh, but I, I've seen a lot of people investing a lot of time on someone that that um, has their own time in their lives. Maybe this is not the right time to go into the topics that you are telling them to go into. Maybe the definitions or the decisions or the maturity level that they need in order to commit themselves to a cause is not for them at, at this stage of their lives. So I really, I really, you know, as much as I care about everybody's uh, development. I know that there is a moment where you have to say, okay, um, you either, I mean, these are the options and I'm willing to help you walk through one of them or if you, if you want to take a step aside, then that's fine. But, but don't, don't babysit because that doesn't really take to anything, lead you to anything su sustainable in time. Um, which practices would you use to become one? To become one? What, what do you mean, Patricia? To become one. Oh, to become one in the okay in the team. Yeah, the practice is great. Well, the good thing about the, the building, the team building retreat, is that you can actually co-design the experience with with those around you. Okay, you don't need to come up with everything planned and have a full schedule of you know blocks of thirty minutes where everything happens. But I do. I, I would. I would definitely um, schedule it in three three parts. Which is uh, the first is is understanding ourselves beyond the task that we have or beyond the organization we work for and just really focusing on listening to, to who we are. If you want to give a structure to that presentation, you can definitely use uh, the, 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 the hero's journey I was just talking about. The, when did you leave your comfort zone? When did you take the risk to become who you wanted to be? Where, where are the challenges you have facing that? So a bit of a structure to that introduction. Uh, and, and really taking the time and creating the right environment for that to happen. Don't do it if there's a noise around. Don't do it if you're going to be busy. Make sure that the, each, each person feels like they had their moment to tell them, to tell everybody else who they really are and where are, what, in which stage of their life they're in. Uh, somebody in their 20s may be in a certain stage and somebody in their 40s or 50s may be in a different stage, but they're all in stages of their lives. So it's important to have the time to really uh, listen and make everybody feel listened. Then on the second and third part, I would definitely focus on our experiences with teams. If we have experiences with other teams, what have we learned? Do we know what we care about, what we value from someone else? Uh, what are the practices that we had before that worked? Because it is about building this one team. To become one as a team, it doesn't mean that you're going to copy or imitate a different team. It means that you're going to become one in this team right here, right now with these people, these experiences that they had and, you know, their expectations and illusions. So it is important to take the time to see where you're coming from, because I may be telling you my own story and it has to do with my family, my childhood, my, you know, my ideas, my, 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 my setbacks and all that. But then it comes, when it comes to my experience as a team member, I may have learned that it's always important to, let's say, to ask for everybody's opinion before I make a definition of something. And that might be something that is in my DNA of the team. And then um, in, in this team, this new team we're trying to set up, it doesn't really work because we won't have time for that because we're going to be working remotely or for whatever reason. So it is important to have a checkup of your beliefs when it comes to the teamwork. So what do you believe is key to teamwork? and do we all agree on that or do we have a different vision or will it be realistic for this kind of team specifically to fulfill that criteria and when it comes to the third part definitely is a time for the organization and the dream and the purpose and how do we align so these three blocks are very important and um, you can find uh, let's say exercises or dynamics or presentation structures or something that will help you go through that without it being a uh, uh, an open space that never ends or a person takes two hours to talk about their own personal journey. So it's got to be a bit structured, 
but it doesn't have to be super short and super, okay, next person, please. And, and you lose a lot of information there. So that will be the practices I recommend in the becoming one for the team building. There's not really a way to replace a team building retreat. You can, you can do a lot of outings. You can go to a beer, to have a beer at, at a bar. You can do a lot of things, but uh, there's, there, really, there really isn't a, a good replacement for a team building retreat. Let, let me just say that. Um, okay, please share the slides. Definitely the slides are uh, going to be sent out with the, um, to, the, to the mailing list. Javier says, though you mentioned values in the strategy column, practices are intimately connected to individual and group values. How would you recommend to work with values to align and change the practices? Well, when it comes to values, um, my recommendation is to go through the creation and the definition of each of the values that your organization have all over again. I mean, I can end an organization and say, okay, I learned these are the six values, or five values, or four values, and that's it. Or I can go through a process where I end up understanding why these are the values and not others. These are the values that you uh, that you set for the organization. This is the reason why. This is how, to, how you're going to see them in, in practice. Um, so for me, group values have to do with a construction, not an, an understanding, let's say, or not a, okay, I'll, I'll study the values and, and why they became uh, organizational values. I think it has to do with going from the list of a thousand values to the ones that you actually end up defining for the organization and connecting because if, if you define your own, what I usually do with teams is I go through personal values first and uh, what comes, uh, what, what stands out as, as a common ground. Like if I defined love as a value and if somebody else does and somebody else does and somebody else does, then we have that as a common ground. And if the organization has its own values, then, uh, then of course you can connect how love, let, may, maybe say, it's a personal value and organizations don't have love as a value in general. Um, you can connect to that, that, that value to one that contains or, or, or deals with uh, what the essence of love is. So that's what I, how I do it. I usually go through personal values first and then I go through organization and I connect the dots and say, okay, you've said love here and this other value, let's say uh, generosity connects with that and, or contains um, Mario says, can you share your personal experience when, where you learn to face and overcome your fears? Okay. Um, in general, I think that, um, fears, you know, they're, they're, you, 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 see, you, you tend to think that fears are something that you should go away from and you should say, okay, uh, since I fear this, I shouldn't, I shouldn't face it. But I, I, I've gained a lot of self-confidence. Um, Understanding that I was that I was uh, I, I was better at dealing with fears when I was in a context that empowered me or, or that trusted me or that uh, validated me to face that specific fear. For instance, speaking in public in front of a thousand people from around the world, or leading my first um, organizational change uh, project, or Things that, of course, it's the first time you're doing it, you're going to say, okay, I, I may not be the best person for this, or I may not be uh, equipped for this task. But I usually, uh, what I do best when it comes to dealing with fears is I, I, I have a support system that makes it real for me. It says, okay, it's true. You don't have these skills, or it's true. You don't have this experience, but you definitely have these other things. And I, I usually trust that a lot. I don't, um, I don't intend to spend my whole life away from my fears. On the contrary, I say, how do I become surrounded by people that would push me to face them uh, and, and do it in a safe environment? So for me, if you, bottom line, safe environment. That, that's my recommendation. Always have a safe environment. Um, then it says, do you think it's possible to build a one team if each of your members is based in a different country? What kind of practices do you suggest in case of having a global team? Well, very challenging, my friend, very challenging. Um, I know it's, I, I've been a part of a global team three years, so I know what you're talking about. Uh, working remotely from Argentina, having people from Hong Kong and people from all over the place. So I know what it feels like to be a global team. But I also know that, um, 
Although you cannot have a team building retreat, let's say, when you're working thousands of miles away from everybody. But you can definitely install it in blocks and say, okay, let's spend this Saturday afternoon based on block one. And then let's, I mean, you can, you, you like I said, you can't replace it. There's nothing that you can do that's, that's alternative to having a, a retreat, but you can install it in three times and say, okay, let's spend, at the beginning of my experience, we had two hours. First, first we had one hour meetings. Then we started saying, okay, two hour meeting. And then we said, how can we make it longer? Because we need more time. So if you can set aside the time and you can find a good uh, connection, you can definitely replicate the same respect, the same uh, attention. You can definitely uh, be um, empathetic to what the person is saying and you can connect. So as long as you have a connection, you can do it. But don't, res don't, uh, uh, don't, let's say, um, this, don't believe that because you're away, you can never have that feeling of one. Because I know what it feels to, to uh, feel connected to someone who you've only spoken through a webcam or who you've only written to. Because when you share at some level, when that person understands you, you don't need to be physically with them to, to feel all of these things. It is possible. So I, I definitely suggest to, to make installments and, and go on with the agenda like I suggested. Uh, okay, in that line, how do you manage when you have a clear nature, but the rhythm around you, or you're, even the society moves differently? Well, Patricia, this is a big, big decision you have to make. Um, it's not easy to sustain it once you've taken it. It's not easy to say, I will live uh, according to my nature, because of course you're gonna get hurt, you're going to be disappointed, you're going to be frustrated with people. You're going to be confirming that you shouldn't be living your nature, but I definitely suggest to make decisions that uh, um, take you closer to living the purest version of, of the nature of your own personal nature. Um, I've I've made some of those decisions, some of those decisions, and believe me, I've paid the price to not uh, accepting that this world required me to deny who I really, really was in terms of my own nature and my spirit. Um, there are many times when I feel like I've just been fooled or I've just been taken advantage of. And, uh, and I take pride in saying, but you know what? It won't change who I, it won't change what I do. It won't change uh, my nature because I won't, I won't be the consequence of what others have done to me. Definitely. I won't be the consequence of what the context around me around me forces me to be because everybody's fooling me. So, okay, I'm going to start being um, a selfish person that never thinks about anyone else who always thinks about themselves. And, uh, I, I can't, I can't do that. And I think it's a decision that takes time and effort and you pay the price and things happen to you. And, but you know what, it's much better to pay small prices for, living close to your nature than to be in complete denial of it and just being uh, a semi-person because you're walking a life that, uh, you know, negates who you really are. So for me, pay the price, make decisions, and, and do things that, that uh, are more aligned. I went to living in a city to living in a rural area where there's no pavement and where people... I lived in this building, this huge building, and uh, not huge, but a, a tall building that required me to have two locks every time I went into the room, to the house. And one lock and the second lock, and I felt like I was in a prison. I felt like I had to, you know, completely protect myself from all the dangers of the city and uh, potential robbers and potential, all of that. And I hated living like that. It felt like so the opposite of how I live and how I feel. So I moved to this rural area, 15 kilometers away from the city, and uh, I don't lock the door. And the neighbors let me know if somebody left me a message and uh it's completely different to where i lived and uh it's a it's it's not a gated community it's just a it's just a small rural area but I, I live a lot closer to my nature there than i lived in the fancy apartment building i was four or five years ago okay um some team members only work for money he doesn't have much passion of the work how do we influence them with our value okay cool 
Um, the good thing about these things is that there is a potential, there is a, there is a possibility that people never really had access to any of these thoughts. You find a lot of people that never really stopped and think, wow, it's true. I may have been just living a life that's empty and meaningless, and I might now be able to rediscover energy that I didn't know I had. So my first my first suggestion will be to actually spend some time to find out if they are uh, ignorant of what the potential version of themselves could be if they applied or if they dared to define these things for themselves and become purpose, purposeful individuals. So my first suggestion will be, okay, spend some time and see if this is the case. If this is not the case, then that's a different discussion because like I said before, you can't really force someone to go into a mode of purpose and alignment and motivation and you know all of these things if they really don't care. So for me, when it comes to working with people, it's either, okay, I can't leave these people out because they're valuable, because they're whoever, they're, they're key to the team. Okay, but I'm not going to have the expectation of them giving us 150% and working to their fullest because they're not going to do it. So I either resign to that expectation or I change the person, I change the team member. There's no room for mediocrity, or there's no room for apathy or for saying, well, I know this organization wants to achieve this, but I don't, really, I don't really care. I mean, as long as they pay me, it's fine. There's not much room for that. In today's world, there's no much room for that. Uh, so either try and see if they have it, in, if it's sleeping inside of them, or uh, resign to the idea that they will give you their fullest uh, potential. Vivian. Can you share an experience of an unsuccessful team and others that was successful? What was the difference? Well, well uh, besides everything I'm mentioning here, lack of purpose, lack of clarity, um, no common ground, no agreed philosophy on how life is, I would say that they were also um, lacking the ability of self-awareness. So, uh, for me, as long as you can learn from situations, as long as you can, uh, let's say you go for a pizza at night with your team and you say, Hey, you know, how do we, why do you think we failed at this? Or why do you think we're not being as successful as, as, as we should be? And there is the ability to self-reflect, to really go into yourself and say, well, I may have been, uh, a bit jealous of that situation and that it might have, might have affected my concentration and that might have had to do with the fact that I didn't get to the results you were expecting from me. I mean, for me, the key difference or the first thing I look for when I work with teams is, are these people self-aware? Do they know that they're doing things? Do they know that they're applying certain defense mechanisms? Do they know that they have behaviors that are caused by others? Do you know, do they know that um, they could be, uh, they could be, um, let's say, given less than what they could because they're affected by some condition they might not be aware of. So because uh, a certain leader reminds them of their father, then they're willing to rebel against that leader just because they remind them of how their father was. Are they aware of that? Do they know that that's the reason? Uh, I work with teams where um, after a lot, a lot of conversations and, and time spent you know, dealing with these things, they realize that they had been uh, you know, uh, blocking a decision but because it had to do with something that they had blocked in their lives before or something that happened to them. And, uh, so it's only through self-awareness that you can actually evolve into a purposeful team. Without self-awareness, you're just individuals trying to, uh, you know, trying to make ends meet. And so that's, uh, that's diff difficult sometimes to, to, to intervene. As, as a consultant or as a coach. Uh, Patricia says, totally agree, but need to be careful as we sometimes miss our ideal or idealize what we don't have. Definitely, a lot of people spend a lot of time uh, thinking that somebody else has a better job, a better, a better life, or a better luck. And the fact is that you make your own, and you, as long as you, you become self-aware and that you understand yourself and you say okay this is happening to me because I know, I know what this is happening to me I know what I'm feeling now I know why I'm feeling it I know that this feeling because I, I've seen it before I've felt it before so I am now aware that I'm going through this feeling because 
this is this is happening. Okay, I know. I'll, I'll self-regulate because that's the key. You know, to be self-aware is to lead the path towards self-regulation. And when you know that something is affecting you because you know yourself because you're self-aware, then you can self-regulate. And and that's the discipline that I was mentioning at first when it comes to the key practices of purposeful leaders is to have the discipline to really um, understand yourself, regulate, and act in a way that it's just beneficial to everybody. Okay, well, we're reaching the time we had, and I, I don't see any other questions, so I'm assuming that uh, that's all the questions we have. Is there any final comment that you'd like to have? Any Anything that I can take with me? Well done. Well, thank you, Patricia. Anything else? Any Anybody else? You're welcome, Vernia. Um, I'm really happy to have shared this moment with you, and uh, I know it's it's very it's very easy to get together. As you see, this is just about subscribing and and, and finding the time to share ideas, and uh, I definitely appreciate uh, definitely appreciate uh, having this session with you. There is a recorded version, and you will get that uh, if you're in the mailing list. And if you're here, it's because you're in the mailing list. You will get a recorded version of this of this webinar, and I'm happy to expand on any of the topics that I mentioned. The, the presentation will be available. Is there anything anything you'd like to ask? I'm super, on, uh, super open to, to clarifying or giving more examples. I try to be short today. Uh, I usually take longer to explain every concept, but I want it to be short so that I would allow for you to have questions or comments. Thank you so much, and, uh, and we'll continue talking, yeah? And thank you, Peter, for introducing me. Uh, great. Thank you, Javier. Want to hear more from Isaac? Definitely. I can, I can send you information on that. Peter, it's up to you now, right? Are you there? OK. Well, guys, thank you so much. And we'll stay in touch. Thank you. Bye-bye.